thinking about is, you know, I never heard of a hedge fund before you got into hedge funds back. I feel like what I'm going to say, off the top of my head, it was like late 90s, early 2000s. We were hanging out in a pub in London. And you're like, yeah, I'm working for Goldman Sachs. I'm working in hedge funds. Mm. And I was like, you know, what the bleep is a hedge fund? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I, got, I was very lucky, right? I, I kind of got, uh, I got sent over to London in 99 to basically facilitate the unwind of long-term. So long-term capital had blown up. Okay, so this is like, that's like what, 99? 98, 99. And that was a hedge fund, right? Yeah. That did was, you know what a hedge fund was when you got into the I space? I did, I did okay. because, that, because even in the, I, I rejoined Goldman after school in 96, and even then you knew that was the seat. Right, you wanted to be. If you were a salesperson, right, you wanted to be in the hedge fund seat. Why? Because they were doing the biggest trades. They were the salespeople got paid the most amount of money. <laughs> the people they were covering were the biggest personalities, right? Julian Robertson, right? More capital. These were George Soros, right? These were the big names in the space. Okay. And so, if you wanted to, if you just looked around at who was advancing at the firm, they were either the traders who were doing the most trades with the hedge funds, or the salespeople who were covering them. So you could sort of have a wonderful career covering the fidelities of the world, right? But you right. had a pretty sexy career if you were covering the hedge funds. And so that was a great, great seat. And I think to this day, it's still the great the great seat. And just for like, I guess our listeners, a lot of are mainly retail investors, like what's your best definition of a hedge fund? Because I think still people don't clearly understand yeah. what a hedge fund is. Right, and, it, and it's a misnomer, right? Right. right. I, mean, yeah. I mean, the original hedge fund was a correct name back in the 40s, but now it's not accurate. I think to well, what me, was it back in the '40s, and what is it today? Well, I think I think then it just meant a, a, a portfolio whose risk was offset by something else. Right, right. So I, I'm I, I'm long this, and I have some hedge. Against, I'm short something else against it. Right. I have some type of hedge to my investment. I'm not just naked exposed to the price of one thing. It's like right? when one thing zigs, the other thing zags. zags. Right. Right. Okay. I think now, or to me, it just means almost complete freedom provided your legal docs give it to you to trade whatever it is you want, right? In equities, right. commodities, credit, cryptocurrencies. It's just the ability to kind of look at the entire field and invest whatever you want. And that's where funds get into trouble. And that's when investors' ears really perk up. And you know, you, it's called style drift, right? All of a sudden, I am an equity I'm an equities guy or girl, and I've launched my fund. I tell you, I'm going to do these three or four bespoke equity strategies. And all of a sudden, I'm over here doing some emerging market or commodities or mortgage trade in which I have zero expertise. Right. That's a problem. And that's when funds get into problem. And, that, and that's when funds get into problems. And that's when investors kind of say, hey, wait a minute. That's not what you do. And they go, well, but we had this, you know, we have this person we hired. We had this view that we think is really great or this consultant that we think really helped us figure it out. Or that's just generally doesn't work. Um, there are heads of funds who are just savants and do have the ability to understand a wide variety of instruments, or they've traded a wide variety of instruments. And then you can have a conversation, but I think yeah. you have to have a tremendous amount of longevity, credibility, an investor base who understands you because you've explained things to them that give you the ability to be a bit more broad. But, but if you don't have that, that's a giant red flag. Right. To just right. Well, okay. So wait, take us back a little bit. So you got out of school. Yeah. Um, was this a Princeton or Dartmouth at this time? At this point, I, I joined out of undergrad. Okay. So um, this is 1996. 91. 91. Dex. Okay. Yeah. Get put on the convertible bond desk. I applied for investment banking. Somehow it got bounced to sales and trading. I had no idea what sales and trading was. Well, if you're related to us, zero. I don't think analytics were the place to be for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. So end up at Goldman and converts uh, in sales and trading and loved it. And okay, why uh, did you love it? What was it? What was like? What was like the early '90s being on Wall Street at Goldman Sachs? What was that like? It's look. It's it's the closest thing to an athletic field in finance that you can find. Explain that just the atmosphere, right? You're, there's uh, hundreds of people on the floor. It's loud. Um, it's interactive. Um, there's just a lot going on. There's a lot of talking, a lot of screaming, a lot of transacting. Uh, it's just fun. It's a, it's, a, it's a lot of adrenaline. Um, and you got it, but you have to be a human being because you and I, you're the, I'm the salesperson, you're the trader. We're arguing over, you know, quarters, pennies, nickels, dimes, but, but we both want, everybody wants to get something done. Right. So you have to find a way to get it done amidst 
the chaos. And so it's just a really fun place for a young person who's used to kind of being in sort of an active environment. So, so exactly what was your job though? So if you're like a layman, so you, you, I know you played football in college, obviously mm. we saw you play. Um, so you get to Goldman Sachs, you're on the floor as a salesperson. Like, what was your job? Like, why were you calling people? What kind of transactions were you trying to do? Sure. Can you so unpack that a little bit? The, the one thing, um, that was really fun about being on the convertible bond desk was you were, you did everything. You researched the idea, you called the client, you pitched the idea, and then if they wanted to do it, you transacted. Whereas on other parts of the equity trading floor, you kind of finish the transaction or you start it, but you never do the whole thing. Right. So in convertible bonds, you got to do the whole thing. So if you were my client, I would say, hey, Rye, this is the idea that we have and this is why we like it. And you would say, okay, great, where? And you give the price and then we trade it and then we execute and then we're done. So you could do the whole trade from start to finish and you could see it, right? As opposed to kind of just either picking it up at the beginning and not finishing it or just kind of finishing it, but not knowing why you're doing it in the first place. So there's a lot of autonomy there. And is it like something like instantaneously, you call that client and you can get that deal or that trade done right away, or how did it work? Look, I knew myself well enough. I had watched Bob do his thing, and I knew myself well <laughs> enough to know that me in a room with a phone was not gonna be <laughs> good for my personality. I, If you start talking to me, I'm great. If I have to start talking to you, right. we have a problem. <laughs> Right. I'm just not good at that. <laughs> so my, in my own, in my head, I was thinking, well, if I go and do this institutional thing, even if they're institutions that have a poor or stale relationship with Goldman, at least they have one. So it's kind of like the warm call versus the cold call. What you're referring to is we know when Bob started yeah. his career back in the seventies, Bob rumor has it all you did was cold call. <laughs> no, I, I just visited with all my rich uncles. So, you know, the, these institutions, unlike people, institutions generally have to do something. Right. right. Human beings don't. Right. Right. Human beings acting on behalf of themselves don't have to do anything. Institutions sitting on pools of capital generally do. They have a benchmark to meet or if it's an absolute return, they have P&L to generate. So I just felt like for me, knowing myself at 21, I was going to be better off with someone who I knew how to talk to me <laughs> and I could at least go from there. Does that make sense? No, it makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. And Joe, were you doing like multiple trades like this a day or is this like a one one trade a day? Oh, like, no, yeah. no, no, no. I mean, multiple, multiple trades a day. Um, your day began in the morning and you were doing trades around data releases and then you're doing trades into the close. I mean, it was it was volume, right? It was, and were there trades that took longer than a day? Absolutely. And you liked working on those. But, you know, most of the time it was things that were happening in the moment. You know, non-farm payroll, Friday morning, at 8.30, you were ready to do something, right? Yeah. And that's exciting, right? Yeah. That was just, it was just a really exciting environment um, to be a part of at that age. And But you had to be you know, on your toes all the time because people were reacting to things constantly. And you didn't always know why, but you had to facilitate. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Is it like that today or is that like a, a bygone era? Like you, you, could you go to a trading floor today and is it anything like it was in the early 90s? Uh, no. Uh, you know, I, I exited the business uh, in 2012 okay. because, you know, when I came back from London to New York with Goldman, I was no longer in a sales function. And my role was to work with the regulators to figure out what had just happened, right, post-2008 and to implement Dodd-Frank. And you could just see that this business was going to be totally different than what I grew up with. I mean, I, I'm in a room with a regulator and up on the wall is a picture of a salesperson and, you know, five or six trades that they did, like it was a fraternity, right? And they go, <laughs> you know, why are, why did this salesperson get X amount in gross credit to do a money market trade with the state of Wisconsin, right? Right. Like just excruciating detail. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? Why were you paid this? And you just knew that the scrutiny on this part of the business, given the risks that the banks took for themselves, was going to go away. Right. And if right. you can't warehouse the risk anymore, it's a very, very different place. So it seems like it was a big party. Great financial crisis happened and the regulators ruined everything. <laughs> kind of. I mean, yeah. Yeah. The Wild West was over. Essentially. Yeah. Look, is it, has it, yeah. has it, it, it's reverted to form a little bit since then, certainly. But sure. in that kind of 08, 9, 10, 11, 12 area, when there were so many eyes on these businesses, things changed. They had to change. The compensation level changed. The caliber of people changed, and 
the quality of individual that was then in those seats changed because they were just trained in a different way. So Joe, how did that change your job? I left it. I left it because I knew, I knew it was not going to be the same. Right. And I remember sitting at my desk in 2008 and, and Lehman's going down and I'm thinking to myself and Goldman's stock was going back to almost its IPO price. And I'm sitting there going, what are my skills? Like, what can I do in life if we're next, Goldman? And I kind of came back to two decisions again. And one of them was sort of the private wealth route, because I was been a markets guy for a long time. Yep. Or two was going to the hedge fund side and being someone who raised capital, like an investor relations kind of person. And again, knowing what I knew about myself, like I said before, I just didn't think at 40 something, the private wealth route was something I had the skill set for. Right. But I could walk into a hedge fund and talk about the strategies to investors because that's what I did for my job, right? I could talk about, I knew markets and I knew my investors. So now all of a sudden I'm working for them and I can describe right. their strategies to other people. And my first week on the job, I was like, man, I should have done this a long, long time ago because all of a sudden my clients are not 15 hedge funds who were talking to 15 people just like me. Right. There are four people sitting in Harrisburg for the state of Pennsylvania covering six asset classes. And they got this hedge fund investment and they're trying to figure out what it is. And they don't even understand how it works. And you understand the plumbing of all these things because that's what you did at Goldman, right. essentially. And yeah. so now I'm able to call this person in Harrisburg and say, hey, look, these are the trades that we got. And you know, you're not giving away state secrets because you have to protect a little bit of what the, yeah. Right. This the, the confidentiality of the risk that you have on. But hey, look, this is what we have. These are the three trades that we're running that we really like. These are the ones that aren't working. And here's why. So when that person's boss says, hey, how's our how's XYZ fund doing? They can say, well, not a great month. They had these three trades on. They didn't work. They still like them. Here's why. Loved that. Yeah. Loved that. I, I don't have to look at S&P futures or 10 year treasuries. 5,000 times a day. <laughs> I can get up out of my chair. Yeah. And when I was doing that transition, it was super humbling because I'm here, I am taking, all right, I'm a managing director at Goldman. I'm going to go to a hedge fund. Everyone's going to want to talk to me. You wanted to talk to me. Why? Because there were 10,000 people like me trying to flee the sales and trading seat at the same time. <laughs> okay. And because I didn't know the people and I didn't, and I had never done it before. Right. My 20 years at Goldman meant absolutely zero. And I was, it was super humbling. So then I get a job at a fund who was a former client of mine and they did fixed income relative value called Capulet and I covered them for a decade and I knew their strategy. I was like, yeah. you know, I knew their strategy so well that I knew I could do it. And so I got hired there and that's when I was like, yep, this is it for me. I can do this. Um, and in that transition, people would go, well, how are you gonna do this? Because you're used to doing 50 trades a day. Now you might do a couple investments a year, right? Due diligence from a state pension fund could take a year and a half. Just to get someone it on board. It could take two years. Sure, yeah. Right? And so I was like, great, love it, right? And so it, I really kind of fell into this this role and it was the right choice for me and, and I love, love what I do now. It really right. is great. And um, and would I, would I advise my kids to go into sales and trading? Probably, probably not. Okay, why? Um. The part about technology replacing you has been something I've heard for 20 years. Yeah. So it's it's true in some ways, right? There's certain some, there's a lot of things that have become automated, um, but a lot of things are still bespoke, and and you still need a human being at the end of the day, right? If I don't want to do a 10 year trade and I want to do an 8.5 year trade, you know, you can do that now, but originally you couldn't. You could only kind of trade five, 10, 30, right? You couldn't do okay. seven and a half years or 6.2 yeah. years, right? So there was a need for a human being because you did kind of bespoke off the run things they were a little more right customizing so, more of that human interaction explain right. it i feel like in our business like we could replace bob and chris but me you know what i do is just so unique no, it, it no couldn't way. happen yeah dad do, do you remember like when ryan shows up for work i can't remember the last time <laughs> so joe so i'm seeing that the guy one of the guys you worked for um just bought a dinosaur fossil for 44.6 million uh, <laughs> yesterday or the other day <laughs> um, I think that was a good decision. That's part of the job, Bob. And when you're talking to a pension fund and, and half the guys or women on that pension fund are, you know, 25 year veterans of the police force or the fire department, and they're retired. They want to know, why did you buy that dinosaur fossil? <laughs> and you have to have an answer, you know, and, and 
the only thing that saves you is is performance right right like if you, yeah. you know and and you know so much of my conversations uh with potential investors revolve around or at least start with net returns and either you believe in net returns or you don't. And if you don't, when you say net returns mean just like what's the performance going to be? Returns net of fees. fees. Right. Right. Which, so it, that's what everyone cares about. Right. right? So yeah. if, if I deliver you twenty percent every year, but it costs me ten to do it, and you're only down to a ten percent return. Right. But if the market's four, okay. Right. So right. right? So it, it really is. It really comes down to if people are believers in, in in net returns and if those return streams are orthogonal to what they have. But you know, Bob. If you're buying a dinosaur fossil and you and you're not, you know, you're not, you're barely generating LIBOR, you got a problem. So there's right? a there's a, a hedge problem. fund manager that bought a dinosaur fossil as part of their yeah they, all, all kinds of stuff. Right. What's the wildest art, thing I, that someone's bought for a hedge fund? Usually it's art. Okay. And art, as you know, has many different yeah subjective opinions around a piece of art. So <laughs> you know, it just it just kind of depends on people's taste. But I think most of the time you're not you're kind of defending art or real estate so jay you go back to long-term capital right there's there's a you know you had a, a brilliant a savant you know puts together a hedge fund he hires the smartest people from harvard and penn and princeton uh they had every algorithm had it all figured out and then they almost took down the entire financial system because of their leverage i assume right it was because of the leverage so what what prevents any of these savants from doing that now yeah like i think i think there's a i think there's a greater understanding of how the pieces fit together i think there are um better and more independent risk managers at these institutions i'll give you, I'll give you an example yeah the two funds that i've been at the first fund i would go in I would go into the risk meeting and the head of the fund would be at one end of the table and he's taking, you know, probably half the risk in the fund and the head of risk is sitting at the other end of the table and then everybody else is in the middle. My confidence in the head of the fund. Yeah. His ability to take the risk manager's advice was zero. He was just not going to listen to zero. It. Right. Barring yeah. him doing something illegal, a position limit. Right. Yeah. I just had zero confidence that he was going to listen to his risk manager. Okay. So you knew they were like the Wild West. Thing. Yeah. The second place I went to, the head of the fund didn't take risk, right? Right. And the risk managers reported to the head of the fund and had and could care less what the PM wanted to do. Is that say, the better place to be? 100%. Okay. Because no one's emotionally yeah. the only person who's emotionally tied to the trade is the trader. Meaning you have a trade on and tanks roll into the Ukraine. And boy, that just blew your trade up. Yeah. Is this an opportunity or are we cutting this thing? Cause we have no idea what Putin's going to do. Right. And that's when you have conversations with your PM, with your risk manager, with the head of the fund and say, Hey, is this, are we, are we just game over on this thing? Cause we just don't know. Or are we open mind enough to say, maybe we double down on this trade hundred percent. Right. Or do we say, Hey, look, this is a great opportunity. This is what we think yeah. about this particular instance. And we think that this trade actually is more attractive now and actually should come back. And but and those are those are thoughtful conversations you have to have with people who are not emotionally invested in the trade. Which getting back to the earlier point, is why you don't want the head of the fund taking risk, and you want your risk manager to be an independent body. Can you look at this trade though objectively, or are you worried about paying your guys? Right, that's a real conversation. Right, right. Like, tell me the fundamentals of this trade now, and try to block out your wife and kids and your tuition payments at the same time. Like, good luck with that. It's hard. Yeah. But that's what I'm asking you to do. Right. You right. need so, working together to right. assess the risks in the fund right. so it doesn't blow up, which sounds like most hedge funds do. <laughs> we're, we're, right. We're, we're looking at this thing. And, and you know, the, the right yeah. answer may be, right. you're fired. I hate this risk. Yeah. Right. It may be. And I've seen that happen. Sure. And, and the right answer may be, no, man, this is great. Yeah. Well, so you had that, Joe. You had the pressure of the client, too. The client could be upset. You know, all the different investors could be upset at the same time. So you get the pressure from the investor plus the, the firm. Is that is that an issue or is it just? The answer is it depends. Yeah, okay. Is it a trade that you have shared with your investors? Some you do. I mean, you've got thousands of trades. You don't share all of them. Right. But if it's a trade that your investor is aware of, um, you know, I would communicate our, our big risks all the time. So if someone knows that it's underperforming, you know, 
you never want to communicate too much to the outside world because it just goes everywhere, right? You think that, oh, well, I'm going to tell my investor and, and if he tells my competitor, then that's going to hurt him too. People don't always act in the way that they should. Right. So you have to be it's a little true. careful. They, destroy you. They, 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 they know you're on the run and they know you had, where, you're, where your position is, you're done. A hundred percent. Yeah. So, yeah. but if it's an investor who knew what's going on, right? you would say it may be a week or two after, this is the decision that we came to and here's why. Um, and that's, that's a really important relationship you have to have with your investors. And, and, and that's why um, a lot of hedge funds will tend to the institutional investor base because these are big, sophisticated risks and right. right or wrong, they think that those people are have a different time horizon Right, if you're a pension fund, you got a, or an endowment, you got a, not an you endowment, a long time exactly. horizon. Long term horizon, less emotional. Right. Whereas a retail investor who's probably more dependent on that money, um, is going to be way more emotional. Not that our clients are ever emotional. Um, that's sarcasm, but uh, that makes a lot of sense. That's, right, like institutions that's the, are. A that's better the place bad rap, play. right? That retail investors get because if you look at the two biggest multi-strat hedge funds in the world, one is all institutional, and the other is tremendous amount of, of high net worth, you know, single family office, multifamily office, bank platform. Right. And their money is locked up. They have locked up capital for three, five years. And their point is, if it's locked up capital, I don't care who it is. Right. I don't care if you're retail, institutional. I got your money for five years. I don't <laughs> right. care where I don't care where you are, where you're yeah. from. Right. So that's another view as well. So there's different different funds have different philosophies as to what they want their investor bases to look like. And and some of it is institutions are stickier. And they understand the sophistication and retail is not. And right or wrong, that's just, you know. That's the viewpoint. The right. fund has to decide. Hey, hope you're enjoying the most recent episode of Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you saved over a million dollars, Bob, Chris, and I will put together for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, how do you take social security? How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you factor in inflation? We'll build a dynamic income plan for you. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been up and down with the markets, extremely volatile, or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, you can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan, tie it to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, we'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost, optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you want this full holistic review and you saved over a million dollars, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. So Joe, I want to go back to something you said a few yeah. minutes ago yeah. about, you know, getting the trader's head in the right place. Yeah. And I kept thinking about that show on HBO Billions. Yes. And, um, you know, how much is like the actual hedge fund world, like Billions, where you've got a performance coach, you've got people coming in and shrinking the, the, therapist the traders. Yeah. I, I, I went into a, <laughs> I had a, uh, an annual board meeting, investment committee meeting at a pension fund in Switzerland. Okay. And they asked me that exact question. What's the answer? <laughs> the, answer is, the answer is... Hold the suspense over here. The answer yeah. is kind of, right? I mean, right. the aesthetic, right? Yeah. What yeah. does it look like? The trading floor? Like, yes, right? Do we? Ha I've never been anywhere that had a performance coach like her. Right. But the best funds will find ways to develop their people. And if that means it's a performance coach who tells you you need to eat your Wheaties, then that's what you do. What's the craziest you've seen, thing you've seen... Uh, as a strategy with some of these uh, portfolio managers, not what you, not nothing like that. Nothing crazy. Uh, no. no, no, definitely not. I think no. it's all it, it's all done um, in good faith, and it's all done with an eye towards you know, developing your talent. And you know, you want people to stay, and and it's right. very very easy for people to leave these days because the sums are just enormous, and right, you know, you get a year on the beach to get paid while you wait for your next gig, and it's pretty <laughs> sweet, right? But um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, that's very disruptive. 
right. it's really disruptive to constantly have to be replacing people and training new people and they have to hire new people and building their systems and things. So it's, you don't want that. Yeah. Well, and I don't know if you can name the hedge fund you were at, but you were at one of the best hedge funds. I mean, obviously a lot of hedge funds don't do well, but you were probably considered arguably maybe the best hedge fund ever. And you worked for probably maybe one of the smartest, perceived smartest hedge fund managers of all time. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what was the difference between that hedge fund manager versus everybody else? And mm -hmm. did they have better inside information? Were they privy to that? Or was it just skill? Like what was the difference between having working for one of the best hedge funds of all time versus working for any right. hedge fund that maybe took too much risk and blew up? The first place I went to, they woefully underinvested in anything that wasn't trading oriented. Okay. So if you're trying to get a legal doc signed, right? So you can get an investor. The answer was no. There was zero incentive to help be creative or get, you know, just get something done. Okay. So he was just a, he was a great, great, great trader. Best in class in that strategy. Why was he so good at trading? Like what was it about his ability to trade? He just learned how to construct a portfolio to insulate it from the things that have typically brought down relative value portfolios, either applications of leverage or not, not being overly concentrated in certain issues or having his financing tied up in the right way. Right, so you're not constantly, this is getting in the weeds, but yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of it for relative value is down to how you're financing your positions. And so very, very smart about, about counterparty acquisition. So he's got 25 counterparties as opposed to two, right? So you have your risk spread around to a bunch of different counterparties. So you're never- So better risk management, but also like I have to imagine you still have to have some foresight that a lot of other people don't when it comes to what kind of, I don't know, like what kind of geopolitical or what other type of events could happen, right? Isn't your ability to predict the future have to be better? Yeah, no, way of putting it? I think so. And I, why? Look, everybody generally has access to the same information, right? For the most part. There's a constant yes. struggle to okay. bring in this consultant. Ben Bernanke just left the Fed. Let's bring him in for a year, right? And give him insight to what the Fed's going to do. You try to do all that stuff and they all try to do that stuff. And they're usually wrong, by the way. Usually, yeah. <laughs> But at the end of the day, it's just a combination of, look, in, in, in my experience in this particular fund, it was a super, super niche strategy. And it was very, very technical. So there wasn't always a huge amount of macro um, speculation that he was doing. He was understanding the technicalities of the relationship between bonds and futures and what that meant and what the different issuance cycles meant for the delivery of that bond. We're talking really deep in the weed stuff, but he was just very, very good at understanding the mechanics of a very specific event that happens four times a year. Okay. Right? And so it was just different. It's, it's, it's almost this like is, astrology, it sounds this like. This is not like George Soros try, trying to break the Bank of England, right? This right. is, this is, we're deep in the weeds on this stuff, right? And so that was a different thing. And then, and then you go to my next place and, and he's just, not only has he traded everything himself, right? He's a phenomenal businessman. When you go in on day one, everything, you just noticed that everything was done with the highest quality person in the best possible way. From signing, uh, you know, your contract to your 401k to your health plan, like you did, everything was just done top, top notch. And I had two experiences. One was at Goldman and two was at the second place. And when I would walk into a room with a client or an investor, and I may not know, I would may not know who I was meeting, right? But I was a hundred percent confident that that person was going to be the best. I just knew it. I didn't right. worry about is this meeting going to be bad? No, I don't even know this person, but I know if they're here, they've been through so much to get here that I have confidence that they're going to be very, very good. Right. right. And so I think that what makes the good funds great is. Number one, you have to have a brand that attracts talent such that if I think I'm a top five PM in technology, I want to go there, right? right. So your ability to attract talent has to be not just talent, the, the best top decile. And right. as I said, people who know how to take risk, know how to, and know how to hire people. If you, where you could be the best PM in the world at my last place. If people didn't want to follow you and work for you, you got fired. Interesting. You had to be able to attract people to your platform so you could scale what you did. Right. Right. So number one, you have to be able to attract 
AAA plus talent. And that's just through how have you marketed your brand, right? Right. Two, I think you have to have a founder who has traded everything you've traded and knows everything you do as well as you do, if not better. There right. would be times when my RPMs would get a phone call and I would talk to them about it and they would go, man, how did he know? He calls me always <laughs> with the exact question that is driving me crazy. And it's right. not a 60,000 foot question. Right. It's a two foot question. Right. So you have to have a founder who scares the crap out of his or her PMs because he knows what they know. The details matter. Right. Yeah. Not just yeah. the details, but like, like <laughs> more than like yeah. details you don't even think of. So a really credible founder who's done it and knows yeah. your job. Three, we talked about it. Really, really credible and independent risk people who understand your market. So you can't snow me with some BS about why you should have, right? right? Like, it's a great point. Really understand your space. Yeah. And the best places have risk people who have backgrounds in the yeah. individual things. Equity, we trade equities. Here's yeah. your equity risk guy. We trade fixed income. Here's your fixed income risk guy. Here's your commodities yeah. risk a girl, right? So, so those three things. And then you have to have infrastructure. You have to build what you ask me for, Ryan. Mm -hmm. If I hire you, I need to be able to give you an infrastructure that you know you can't take anywhere else. And not okay. just because it's IP, but it's because you know that another place isn't as well they can't funded replicate it. to they can't give it to you. It. Yeah. Got it. So you okay. say, I need these tools to understand my yeah. market. And even you could be spitballing. There's five guys and girls listening to you, writing everything down, and yeah. they're going to build you that. <laughs> and then you go, well, you know, the hurdles to me for leaving are just so high because now is it me? Or is it what, what they built for me? Right. Right. And we would always say that the worst nightmare was hiring a B plus person because you have a B plus person and an A plus platform. You're leaving cash on the table. Right. So I need the A plus person in the A plus platform that I know that I'm giving them. And then the last thing is an investor base that is sticky, that is smart, and that is educated because you educated them. Right. You can't have hot money coming in no. out of your fund. You need people nope. that understand. And that's where institutions probably are better no suited for that you, you have Not to you have to understand yeah. how to educate your investors so they can look at a screen and yeah. have some sense of how you're doing not <laughs> no totally right these these, right. Are, these requests for 100 percent position transparency are just ridiculous right but you need to know the general risks and the thought processes and the best place is now you're going to see this movement away from the star systems of the George Soros's and the 20 years plus years. What's the, the star system? You know, the, like the one main PM or I'm investing There's in one this star. fund right, right, for right. this person because that, right. that person may leave, right? So Got it. what okay. you want to build, you want to have a credible founder who builds a process that is replicable. And then if you leave, it's yeah. like football. Next man, next woman up, going to yeah. sit in that seat. And the investors have to be convinced of that because otherwise yeah. they go, oh, no, Chris is leaving. You know, am I going to yeah. redeem? I will replace him with AI. Right. But it's like, no, no, no. But yeah. I think but actually it's <laughs> right. not dissimilar from our own business. And I'm like more of a microcosm where, you know, we based ours around a process. And, you know, I would say the same thing is everything we think about is from a risk management perspective. It makes a lot of sense. We always think about, which sounds similar to this, is what can go wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the right attitude, right? Is, is thinking about more about the downside. Everyone, you know, we're in a bull market right now. They think about the upside. But we always say is, you know, what creates return over time is not getting, not making hay when the sun shines, but it's not getting crushed when everything goes against you, when the markets right. go against you. And I think that's where investors make a big mistake. Right, right. No, I, as I, you and I have talked about before, I mean, from my old seat, it didn't take me long to realize that I should probably be in index funds, right? Because I haven't <laughs> seen anybody consistently good enough. I've seen one, right? Right. And, that's our and, philosophy. Right. Yeah. No, and, and that's why I, I, you guys have been yeah. right for for a really, really long time. And and I've had a front row seat to that, right? It's just people, yeah. you know, and in, in, in a lot of these funds, you, it, it's just for me, my opinion, what I've experienced, it's just not, it's just not worth it, right? And 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 the reality is that the people who I think can legit beat the market in my lifetime, my former employer did, right? You look at 19% net over three decades is my investable lifetime. They have beat the market over that time and not by a little bit, right? So yeah. it's possible. But can you get access to them? Nope. No, exactly. You can't, you can't get access. And to them. when they tell you that they're closed, you should listen to them because you don't want, you don't want them to be overcapitalized for the space. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to dilute what they can do, right? They're 
so the returns. So when these funds say, hey, we're closed, you should be okay with that, right? And you know, in Millennium's return, I think like $60 billion to investors in the last five, 10 years, that's a lot of money. Yeah. And that's not great because investors, well, now what am I gonna do with it? I have to redeploy it where, right? You're giving right. me back my P&L because you don't wanna be overcapitalized, that's fine, and I applaud you for that. But now I got a chunk of money. Yeah. What am I going to do with it? Hey, Joe, well, just real quick. I don't want to. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you're, I know that this has been a burning question on my mind. And remember that, you know, the, the fund that we were working for was stopping taking capital. So, like, yeah. you know, to explain to our audience, why is it bad to be overcapitalized? What, are the, what is the harm in that? The harm in that means is that you then sort of say you have a list of 10 trades that you like. And, you know, maybe one and two are great trades and 10 is not a great trade. But because you have capital, you're, you're deploying it to trade number 10. And that just may not be a great risk reward proposition for your investors. So you end up sort of chasing these sort of marginal trades because you feel like you have to be right. deployed. Right. And you never, you don't ever want that, right? It, it, it's just not, um, you just want your, you, you want your, your risk takers and the things that you're invested in to be, you know, super high convicted. In, in the trades that they have on. And if that's a small number of high conviction trades or a large number, I don't care. But as long as you're convicted about it, yeah. then you know, then that's okay with me as an investor. So you, what, you just don't want to force people to chase you know, marginal opportunities. So it's like so. a guardrail to protect the investors 100%. and to make the trade worthwhile. 100%. Yeah, it's like part of his discipline. 100%. Yeah. You know, and you know, a lot of these funds you know, will get reputations for being, quote, you know, asset gatherers. And that's people who are just raising money because, you know, they can and they can collect fees and they'll kind of worry about the opportunity set later. So I think you really have to make sure that, you know, if you are looking in the alternative space and at hedge funds, you, you take a look at, you know, not just their history, but, you know, the decision making process and, you know, have they created something that, you know, people want to go and, and make a career and not just have a job. The traditional hedge fund structure has been two and twenty, right? Right. Two percent on your assets, and then twenty percent on, on the upside the performance. Most of these multi strats now are what's called a pass through structure, where they pass through expenses related to rent, employee compensation, you name it. And that's why some of these funds can be five, six, seven, eight, and twenty. And that's why you go back to our original point in the conversation around either you're a believer in net returns or you're not. So if I can get you 30% and it costs me eight or nine or 10, so that's say it's 20% net, but the market's up five, you're pretty happy with that and you care less about right. that. As long as I'm not, you know, private jetting everybody around the world. And most places are not, right? They have audits. And, I don't and, know if I believe that. But well, <laughs> but I want to go back to something, Joe. I want to go back to <clears throat> I think your kids should go to the sales and trading desk of uh, Goldman because if you can sell five, six, seven, eight, and 20, six, seven, eight, and get away with it. <laughs> you had great training. I don't know. I don't know like, who's kidding who here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I tell you, Bob, it, it's, a, it's a pretty, it's an opening line in the conversation. Do you believe in net returns? Yes. Okay, great. Let's keep talking. If you say no, it's over. Right. It's just over. Yeah. You know, so, um, but that's what they are now. That's, you know, uh, another good example, right? And this, I think this to me drove this home and I can use names and stuff like that and blah, blah, blah. There was a hedge fund, um, there is a hedge fund called Bluecrest, and it's based in London, run by a guy named Mike Platt, fantastically, fantastically successful um, at what they do. And he was running a sort of more traditional two and 20 structure for a period of time. Right. Until he decided that he could no longer generate returns for his investors at with two and 20, hurdle. Right. he gave, you know, he closed it up. He became a family office. And I'll tell you what, right now, he pays the highest fees to traders than anybody else in the business. So when he's running his own money, right, he knows that you, ha you just have to, you have to, you, these fees are just part of the business if you want to get to that, that ultimate level of, uh, of return profile. And so to me, that was like, well, you know, he couldn't do it anymore. And now it's, <laughs> now it's family office and it's his money. And, and now those fees are, you know, what they're, I'll rephrase, what traders take home as a percentage of their own earnings is the highest at that fund. Cause it's more, they're incentivized to get correct big returns and, and they he, get paid. They get commensurately paid that's right. with doing well. And now he's saying, if you're yeah. managing my money, I want to incentivize the proper profile of risk taker. 
Yes. And to do that, I have to pay him or her yeah. more, a lot. It's all it's but a performance fee. It's performance, a performance fee. fee. Yeah. Fee. Whereas if you're a normal hedge fund, you just get your two and 20 and you can be a lousy fund. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it goes back to you like talking about attracting yeah. and keeping talent. Well, I thought the, um, the, the urban legend on Wall Street is hedge funds started underperforming once uh, insider trading was went away. Um, how many times have you heard that? You know, I, I just never came across it. I, I, what can I tell you? I, you know, I've, I, I just have never seen that. Um, right. you know, but why is, before, to, before the financial crisis, hedge funds had phenomenal track records? Yeah. Post great financial crisis, most hedge funds have dramatically underperformed buying an S&P, S&P 500 index fund. What, yeah. what, what happened? What changed? You can only speak for sort of the space that I witnessed. Sure. And I think post GFC, you had funds that just didn't adjust. They just didn't adjust uh, to get an example. What do you mean by didn't adjust after the great financial crisis? They, their investing style didn't change. Okay, so what was their investing style before that they kept doing that got them into trouble? The difference to me in the drop-off in performance, and this only the landscape I observed, was the sure. macro guys, the big gunslinging, old-school macro hedge fund guys. You give an example of that for, for us laymen. George Soros. Uh, right or you know Julian Robertson. Or, what was the kind of trade that they oh, would do? That was just, three things. Yeah, dollar yen, S and P, Treasuries. Right, those were like the kind of the big, the big trades that people would just punt up and down. So right? I mean, you just like you take a big view of the S and P five hundred is going yes. up, so you just leverage yes. it up. And if you're, it's so it's like yeah, yeah, fifty fifty. Yeah, maybe yeah. you're one hundred percent right, you yeah. crush it, or you're wrong and you just implode. Yeah, or George Soros in the Bank of England trade, right? You're betting against the pound, right? These right. big, big thematic monstrous trades but why did they work so well before the great financial crisis not after uh it's a good question i don't know i i, I think you know they were they were a new feature of the market that really was unbound they didn't have the restrictions of some other types of investment vehicles at that time and as i say, they could do kind of whatever they wanted with an investor base that kind of let them do whatever they wanted right they weren't beholden to shareholders right so there's more just, restrictions just in, on the type of leverage and, the, and yes. the type of risk you can yeah take. i mean it's just speculation and then i think at the end i observed some of those funds just really not be able to adjust to a, a new a new state of play where central banks yeah. were acting in different ways right like the mechanisms were, were changing the, the, the thought processes, the decision-making processes of central banks was just different. We always say this, right? The market, you know, it doesn't always repeat, but it often rhymes, but it doesn't always rhyme. Right. So it's, you know, a trade that might've worked before it doesn't work. And then when you have everybody trying the same or doing the same transaction, as you said, Joe, and it could happen within a fund where everybody has on a similar trade and then all of a sudden you're totally correlated instead of being negatively correlated. Um, and I think it speaks to, like you said, out of 10 of your big clients, nine are gone, right? It's, um, you know, I think it speaks to the efficiency of the markets and the risk. And, and, you know, risk is something that is, to me, is only recognized totally in hindsight. You know, a lot of times you don't realize you're taking that kind of risk and, you know, why you're doing it. So it's, um, it's fascinating. You've had a, you've had a, a front row seat, you know, to the evolution of, of risk and investing. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, when you look at these, I understand where you're going with the question. If you sort of look at where you're, what you're trying to do, right? If you're an equity long short hedge fund, right? And you're a technology PM, you are, I'm making this up. You're long Microsoft and right. you're short Intel or whatever. And you're looking to capture these minuscule changes right. in that relationship. And depending on how much leverage you put on the trade, even if it's a small move, you have enough leverage, the payout's big. But what underpins that bet? Okay. Right? And how do you acquire the information that allows you to make a judgment on one versus the other? And that just means you need to be uber informed about everything. And right. And so. Sounds like the information was a little looser before the great financial I, I, crisis. I, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, what, what, what the funds will have are, are right. the, the banks organized, the investment banks have teams called corporate access. And what corporate access does is corporate access ensures that the hedge fund that wants access to the C-suite of Microsoft gets it. Okay. Based on how much business that fund may do with that bank, right? So the bank will control the access to the C-suite of, of you Microsoft, it, Pepsi, right, right, right. whoever. Yeah, yeah. And so, so the, that's how you get in the room with you and you know, right. five people just like you talking to the CIO of Pepsi. Right. And, and so that's how that works. 
right? Sure. And your job is to know everything you possibly can about the firms in your small world. It's probably only 30 to 40 names, right? right. And you have to have, there is no neutral, right? You have to have an opinion, right? Right. And so I, you know, I'm long this and I'm short this. And, and it could be for someone doing something marginally better or marginally sooner than someone else. But you take that, you apply leverage to that. And that's yeah. how those portfolios are built. But you need to be in the room, right? You need to be in the room. You need to have the access to these people who give you, you know, give you insight. And I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not saying it's nefarious. It's not. This stuff is so, this stuff is so tightly controlled. Right. It really, really is um, in, in this day and age. But, but I feel like that's, that's the difference, right? In this day and age. But I feel like maybe earlier on, it was a little looser. I may have wrong well, about that, but maybe that, that's maybe one of the reasons well, why the performance isn't as good as it was yeah. before. Well, the, the, the other crisis. philosophical question is, is it fair for that guy to be in the room? Yeah. Why aren't you in the room? Probably not. But right. Yeah. Probably not. Right. right? Like yeah. you, you can yeah. have that, you can have that conversation. Sure. Right. Um, and I, look, I'm not, I'm not saying anybody's giving yeah. out any non-public info. They're not, but I'm just, it, it's there's certainly insight you glean from being in the room with someone yeah, versus sure. listening to them speak at a conference yes. to 400 people. Right. It's just a different, <laughs> it's a different thing. Yeah. It's fair. Um, and then, you know, I was never involved in any place that was activists and that's a whole different thing. Right. Right. Where now you have, now we're now messing with your board and right. Like that's a whole different beast. <laughs> Which they usually so, do well from themselves, not yeah, their actual yeah. investors. That's another story. Yeah. <laughs> I think statistically. So Joe, um, you know, we all grew up together yeah. and, uh, you know, growing up, you know, in my mind, I'm sure Ryan will agree with me. You know, you were always the athlete in the family. You're always like very competitive. Um, you know, how did you think about money growing up? Like what was your, your perception of it? You know, did you feel like scarcity? Did you feel abundance? It's a good question. I was really interested, Bob, in what you were doing at a pretty young age. Why? I took biology and realized I couldn't be a doctor like my dad. And okay. I, I weeded myself out of medicine very quickly. And, and I said, well, what, what am I interested in? And I kind of was very interested in, in Bob, what you were doing. And you, Bob's been in my life since I was a little kid. So I've seen the, I've seen the ascendance, right, at, at the stages. What was it about? Uh, my dad, or Bob, that you saw that you were like, wow, that's something I'd like to do when I get older or, or you know, get involved in f the financial markets. Yeah. I, um, Bob gave me a book to read. Um, How old was it? How to Buy Stocks, I think it was that, Bob. Maybe it was that, something like that. And and so, <laughs> I, I, so I bought it and I read it and then I kind of just started following like 15 little stocks. I would write them down every day and just kind of see what the price How was. How old were you? Like seventh, eighth grade. So like a, like a mark to market yeah, spreadsheet. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, and yeah. so I was just interested in, I had no exposure to that. My parents had no exposure to that. I didn't yeah. know much about finance. I, my dad was a doctor. My mom was a nurse. So I didn't, but I, I just kind of saw. Was it because Bob was one of those Italian suits with those <laughs> great Italian <laughs> shoes? Was, like yeah. what was the. Yeah. It's the hair and makeup. Is that <laughs> hair real? Or they kind of, they do that as part of the Merle Lynch thing. No, but, 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 but Bob, you had a massive influence on, on me and my career. And, you know, I spent my three college summers at Merle, right? So working for Bob. Working, no, working in the training center. Okay. So for three summers, I would drive up to Princeton and, and in that Merle training center, they would bring in God knows how many brokers every three weeks to take their series seven. And I yeah. was kind of the kid that kind of sat in the library and kind of, hey, you need any help finding whatever for three years. Uh, and then 91 hits and there's a recession and the corporate intern program that they had was canceled. Wow. So okay. now the, what I had invested my time in for three years at Merle was no longer an option. Okay. And so now I'm out, you know, applying for jobs and, um, I sent a resume to every single NFL team and had an interview with the Eagles. No way. And wow. they offered me an unpaid internship. And my second job offer was Goldman Sachs sales and trading. And I wanted more than anything to take the Eagles job, but I couldn't, I had, <laughs> I, I had, I needed, I had student loans and I couldn't graduate from Princeton on my mom's dad's dime and not have a job that paid me anything. You were right. The pressure was on. Plus it was Goldman. Yeah. And I knew enough to know that it was Goldman. Yeah, but. And, I mean, 1991. Is well, I think your dad would have probably wanted you to take the Eagles job too. Yeah. Bob, yeah. 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 it was, it was. Uh, yeah. it was, he loved the Eagles. It Go was Birds. the last year of, of, I think it was Leonard Toes or, or Norman Breen. It was like the last, <laughs> it would have been a disaster. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but that was kind of where I was. And, and you know, but that was how I got into it. Just watching, you know, this, this important person in your life kind of have success and success and success. And and kind of be at the same place for his whole career, which I was at Goldman for 19 years. I wasn't one of these people. Wow, who wanted I didn't realize you were for 19 I don't, years. I don't want to move around. So I, here's Bob. He's having great success at the same place. And so I want to go do that. 
you know, and, and but I knew enough to know that I don't think I can do this cold calling thing. I just don't think that's me. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's how I ended up on the, in the institutional route. And then, and then the, you know, I, I sent my resume to Goldman for banking and it gets rejected and it gets bounced over somehow to sales and trading because the convertible bond desk put out this research publication. Okay. And they needed someone who could write. And because and I, had, actually a very good writer. I had, well, I had to write a yeah. thesis. I had a hundred sure. page, 120 page thesis on the FBI. Yeah. And they're like, well, so that's the how FBI, it kind of, it's amazing. Yeah. But, so I get over to sales and trading. There's whatever, 180 kids hired into banking every yeah. year. There were seven sales and trading analysts in the whole firm. So there weren't a bunch of young, I had no, there was no training program. I, no one taught yeah. me anything. I mean, it was just sit down and do your job. And I kind of had to teach myself because there wasn't a program because the sales and training analyst thing was just so not a thing. Right. Yeah. So, uh, it was an interesting way to grow up. And, um, I knew at that point in time, you really had to have an MBA. I, I looked around at other jobs. Cause you, you didn't study investing in finance. I was a history guy. You're a history guy a history in college, guy. Yeah. which is amazing. You got hired at Goldman Sachs. Well, but there was the writing thing. Yeah. No, I mean, that's actually the banker guy was like, no, we don't right. want you. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Sales and trade, we don't care. Are you, you know, are, are you smart, funny? Do I yeah. want to sit next to you all day? You know, because we're going to tease you <laughs> for the next three years of your life. Um, but it was a great way to kind of figure stuff out. And I looked around the firm, and the jobs that were open to me as a non MBA were just not jobs that I thought had a great trajectory. Sure. So I exited. I went to business school, uh, and then I knew I wanted to come back to Goldman. And I spent a summer at Lehman because I wanted to see another firm. Okay. Also in sales and trading, and I loved Lehman. and it was really yeah. great culture. I was really impressed with that place. This is 96, so we're still- Right, right, way before- They got they a while to go. Sure, yeah. And then I parachute back into Goldman, this time on the fixed income side. And then by 99, or 98, Russia hits. 99, long-term blows up. The guy who covered long-term in London says, I don't think I want to cover long-term anymore. So they <laughs> had no one to effectuate this massive unwind. I mean, this was- Every day of my life for a year. So you were helping unwinding the trades from long-term so, capital? So I would be at my desk. And yeah. if you remember or not, but every bank who had exposure had to send their representative up to Connecticut in the long-term office to oversee this unwind because there was a bailout. And right. they wanted to make sure the unwind worked or was ordered. Sure. So they would say, okay, Joe, uh, tomorrow we're going to do the two to three-year US dollar swap portfolio. There's 476 trades in this portfolio. And if, I, I know you wouldn't and you're an know an English this, major. <laughs> but the the tools to build a swap portfolio in 1999. It was not Excel spreadsheet. I mean, we're talking right? Hunt and Peck. Oh, God. I mean, Oof. and you got all these different conventions, day counts, and you got to do it. And you got, because tomorrow at 12 o'clock, someone from Goldman is calling me, where's my price? And if you get the price, say you say it was, I don't know, annual versus semi-annual day count and you entered it wrong and you put the wrong price in, too bad. Because tomorrow we're doing the four to five year portfolio and you just owned it and they just right. shed the risk and right or wrong, that was the price. And so you're competing with 10 banks over these portfolios. It was just a total nightmare. And I'll tell you a crazy story. So we finished this unwind, right? By this point, I'm on a first name basis with everybody at Long-Term Capital's wife, kids, dogs, right? Wow. So we take them out. We take them out for dinner. There's a little restaurant in Battersea, this little pizza joint. And at the end of every meal, as they would do, they would bring over this little wooden canister. And there were 50 numbers in it. Okay. And if you shook it up and guessed the number, you got your dinner paid for. So here's long-term capital. There's 20 of us. There's golden people. There's long-term capital people. They've just blown up, right? Yeah. On all these convergence bets and probabilities, this and algorithms, that, whatever. And the guy rolls the dice and they nailed it and they got it. And the dinner was free. <laughs> they had one in 50 shot. That was the best trade they made. It. And the best trade they did that year was getting the free pizza. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was the unbelievable. It didn't work out in the real portfolio. It was unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. So Joe, go, go Going back to growing up, uh, and I think we should pay an homage to your dad, Uncle Al. Thank you. You know, first first generation. Well, I, no, he's a, he came over from Sicily. Yeah, I'm first generation. You're first generation. first generation. You know, grew up in South Philly, didn't speak yeah. English for the first couple yeah. of years of his life. Yeah. You know, what was it like growing up with Uncle Al? I mean, you know, what did he teach you? you know, the, the, the thing about the way that he grew up was he was given basically no choices, right? His parents 
I, I, I remember sitting with him in Sicily, looking at a hotel. Bob, with you, yep. we were in Sicily the first time, and we're sitting out on the deck of the hotel, and it is pitch black. We're just looking out into the ocean, and it is pitch yeah. black. And I'm like, man, I, the guts that it took you guys to just pick up and leave um, and go into that abyss, not knowing what's on the other side of that darkness, but also knowing that Mussolini and Hitler are about to rampage through Italy, um, and we got a small window to get out, and, and they did. And, and the choices that his parents gave him was doctor or dentist. That's right. it. That's it. Yeah. And so he had a pretty big burden placed on him by his parents that he needed to live up to, and it was not a smooth path, but ultimately he got there. And so it took me a while to sort of figure it out, but uh, once I kind of got into college, I kind of realized that then it became my responsibility to kind of take the next step for our family, right? So he took a massive step. His parents were literally worked in sweatshops. They take a big risk. They find a way to put him through school at LaSalle. He becomes a medical doctor and we have a great life, puts me through, through college. And now I have an obligation to pay that back. And, you know, we're living in London for 12 years. He's like, Joe, okay, you paid it back. Okay. I'd like you to come home now. <laughs> yeah. But that weighed on me a lot, right? Yeah. Like I, I can't, you know, I have to go and succeed in yep. some way, shape or form. I, I have need to you have, have an overachiever. I, yeah. I have yeah. to find some way to be successful in whatever it is that I'm doing and whether I have or not, we'll, we'll see in the fullness of time. But like that was my motiv motivating factor was I have to, you know, be the first, you know, be the, I can't let this family down. They've already done so much. So I have to kind of carry the mantle and do whatever it is I can. So, yeah. and, and it, from, from them, um, I, you know, the specific lesson that I always think about, and I talked about it at the eulogy was you guys are all there, obviously was never waste a second chance. That's the thing I carry around with me all the time is, is never, ever waste a second chance. And the second one was, and this is a good story. It all comes out in the wash. So like eighth grade, Joe, did you study for your algebra test? Yes. All right, man. All comes down in the wash, right? You're going to get what you're going to get. Either you studied or you didn't. Yeah. yeah. And so my whole life, that was always in my head. And I always had this fear that I was going to be found out. So I'm going to Morristown. I'm going to Princeton. Uh, man, what am I doing at Princeton? I have no business being here. I, yeah. I, I'm just not smart enough. And uh, Okay. I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm an imposter and I will be found out. And then, you know, but it's all going to come out in the wash. You're going to make it. You're not. So you kind of get there and you do that and then you go, okay, well, I have this job at Goldman. Like, Jesus, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, man. These people are pretty smart. This is a pretty good bank. And I, what do I know about finance? Yeah. I, I, it, it, I'm just, it, I'm sunk. I can't do this. I'm not a math guy. I'm a history guy. It's all going to come out in the wash. Okay. Time to go to business school. Oh, Jesus. All right. I'm now I'm gonna go to Tuck and go to Dartmouth. And man, these are really smart people. And I didn't do that great on my ACT and my grades aren't that good. And how am I gonna survive here and imposter again? And um, it's all gonna come out in the wash. Go back to Goldman again. And what do they do? They put me on and Goldman puts me on the hedge fund desk, starting talking to really, really smart people who were doing really, really complex derivatives. And I haven't taken a math class since high school. Yeah, yeah. You're and I'm talking major. to long-term yeah. capital yeah. guys. Man, I'm done. I'm yeah. done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be found out again. And then yeah. I get to the, to the hedge fund and like, oh man, this is, this is the top of the finance crop of my lifetime. I'm going to be surrounded by all these smart people. There's no way I'm going to be able to hang with these guys. And so it's always like that. I'm not, you know, it's all going to come out in the wash if I don't. Yeah. really work. And so I, that's been like that driving factor my whole life is that, you know, if you don't work, you're going to be exposed. So how do you over overcome that hurdle of being found out? You don't, you, you just don't, you never, you never do, but that's the thing because that's what pushes you to keep working. Right. Because you never want to be naked. You never want to be exposed. It's kind of like you're always trying right. to live up to the job. Always. Yeah. And, and you, and you never yeah. want the person you're talking to to call your boss and say, Hey man, uh, Joe's a nice guy, but we need somebody else on our yeah. account. That's like, a, that's the nightmare that's scenario. Yeah. It reminds um, me of the old Annie Grove quote, only the paranoid survive. Totally. I mean, I, I, it's paranoid, but it, 
I'm just a healthy parent. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't, paranoid to me has this negative connotation. Sure. It wasn't, it was motivation. More of a driver. Yeah. It's drive. Yeah. Right. It's like, yeah, I'm going to get breakfast and eat nails. Right. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, you know you're not going to subscribe to the more paranoid side person. Yeah, right? like, <laughs> I'm not going to let you. Right. Expose. And it wasn't adversarial, but I'm not going to let this be the guy or girl that, that shows me what my limit is. Right. Beautifully said. Yeah. So love that. Yeah. Like success on your terms. Yeah. Or trying to sell a derivative trade to the smartest people on in finance and you better, you just have to raise the bar for yourself. And so that's been the motivating thing my whole life. Beautifully said. Yeah. Um, why don't we end with one last question? That was amazing. Yeah. Um, we ask all our guests this, but if you can think of one song or album you heard when you were younger that just like changed your view of the world, how you thought about things, what is it and why? I can't believe I didn't think about this. I've listened to every podcast since 43. <laughs> I should know that you were going to ask this, but I kind of didn't think about myself as a, I just, I didn't think about myself as a guest like that. Like, Jesus. And you're such a hater too. You hate, you're <laughs> such a hater. Oh yeah, well, you know, I judge. Like, you know, if I say now, like, no pressure. If I say yeah. like, born in the USA, you're gonna you're gonna crap on me. I know you are. <laughs> well, you, you know what they say like, you're not supposed no. to discuss politics, religion, <laughs> and play company with Ryan. Not discuss music. It all comes, down, wash, music. It all yeah. comes yeah. out in the wash. <laughs> all right, I, I think I I, I, didn't, I think I know. Okay, I think I know. So I it's the it's 1984. 84. I'm in Europe uh, with like 20 of my best high school friends. It's a big. American yeah. Institute of Foreign Study trip, and I'm in Europe. And my music interest at that point was pretty kind of down the middle. My dad was still yelling at me for switching over to FM radio. Like, it's not <laughs> fully developed. He's like, he's like offended that I went on FM yeah. radio. Um, not listening to like Sid Mark and it's Friday with Frank. Um, so we're on the bus and we're traveling all over Europe by bus, and everybody's swapping cassettes. And because Walkmans have just come out. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so you're getting this education of stuff that you never had really we're familiar with right and so someone gave me the u2 album the unforgettable fire Ooh, Ooh. okay yeah. and i remember driving around paris with the unforgettable fire in my head and going that's pretty cool was it, was it the yellow walkman this is pretty cool <laughs> yeah you know but you remember the fuzzy ear pads yeah, of like course. one's <laughs> off already and, <laughs> but uh you know, the, i could give a lot of answers to that but i think that was the first time where i really was like okay i want to learn more about these guys yeah right and what else have they done so and what cool. are they saying and so i think that for me would probably be my answer but that's couched in the fact that i knew if i said springsteen you would hammer me so <laughs> it's kind of one b correct on all fronts joe yeah. correct on all fronts <laughs> but how can you really be from new jersey and yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah product of my upbringing exactly yeah. well thanks man this is great no i i this is awesome I, yeah this is great to do this i've been wanting to do it for a long time so thank you Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at bebullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Pain Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed.